Oh, I meant to, apologies, I meant to have this on instead of my webcam. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining. 
Uh, we had a lot of people registered tonight, so I think we'll give it a couple more minutes before we get started. Um, if you don't mind just bearing with me and waiting just a couple more minutes and we'll get started. If you're having any issues with connectivity, um, please enter it into the chat box and uh, my coworker Jessica and I can try and help you out. Again, thanks for joining. We're just waiting on a few more people. Um, we had a lot of people registered, so I want to give them a couple extra minutes.
Uh, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. I think 6.05, so we might as well go ahead and get started. Um, if anybody's having any issues with the platform, please type it into the chat and we can try and help you out. Uh, I also believe there should be a way to raise your hand and hopefully um, we can address any issues you have. But we can go ahead and get started. So um, my name is Molly Sennett. I work for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection as the Coral Reef Conservation Program Assistant Manager and also the Reef Injury Prevention and Response Coordinator. Um, it's a long title, but just moving us on tonight to our presentation about protecting Florida's coral reef and the Southeast Florida Action Network. So I am going to turn my webinar camera back off so that it's not a distraction. And we will go ahead and get started. So we have several topics to discuss tonight. Um, for today's agenda, we are going to be reviewing coral biology, Florida's coral reef, what is the Coral Reef Protection Act, uh, what does the Reef Injury Prevention and Response Program do, reviewing Southeast Florida Action Network, or CFAN, and what you can do to help the reefs as well. So, a little bit of, about coral biology. What are corals? Corals are invertebrates made up of identical interconnected polyps. These coral skeletons are made of limestone or calcium carbonate. That's why uh, they have that really hard underlying skeleton. Polyps are connected by tissues over the skeleton, and together, coral polyps are called a coral colony. So you can see on these photos, the zoomed in version is an individual coral polyp, and the background version is all of those smaller polyps together in a coral colony. A coral reef is a living structure. It's made up of these coral polyps. They form coral colonies. I like to think of it as people living in a condominium complex. You have all of these individual condo units um, as the coral polyps and together they make up the entire building. So they are a big kind of interconnected structure. When coral polyps die, they leave behind their hard stony um, structure. It could be branching, it could be bouldering, but they secrete that limestone and the calcium carbonate and that builds up their base skeleton structure over time. We have a couple photos on the bottom here. Um, a nice reef scene on the left and Coral City camera on the right. Uh, I apologize there's no sound, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of what some of the reefs look like down here. I believe this one is in Miami. There are tons of coral reefs around the world, major coral reef regions in the world. Um, they typically fall within a range of the equator, but corals live all over the world in all different continents and different areas. Um, we specifically, all the way over here in Florida, in the Atlantic. Uh, the other main, main known one is in the Pacific with the Great Barrier Reef. But this map just is a good way to illustrate that corals really are all around the world, um, even if they represent a small percentage. Coral reefs of the United States. There are several main um, jurisdictions in the US that have coral reefs. As you can see in this map here, you have Hawaii, Guam, American Samoa, um, Marshall Islands, Florida, of course, the US Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. Um, all across, many US jurisdictions have coral reefs and deal with some of the same um, benefits and issues that coral reefs are associated with. So that was a very, very quick uh, overview of coral biology. I just wanna stop and see if anybody has any questions related to that part before we get a little more uh, specific into Southeast Florida. All right, not seeing anything. So I will go ahead and continue. Um, just to this section is about an overview of Southeast Florida's coral reef. So here's a uh, nice map for you. This shows all the coral reefs in Southeast Florida. Uh, they run from Martin County in the north all the way down through Monroe County to the Dry Tortugas, um, cover several different managed areas. 
but the reef itself is rather long extending reef. Um, there are several county divisions, uh, multiple state and federal boundaries. It's important to note that um, the reefs are not just in state waters, but also they extend into federal waters. Uh, but today I'll be primarily focusing on the northern portion of the reef tract, um, the northern third. But as a whole, I have a nice little video for you. Unfortunately, the sound is not working, but I think you'll get the gist. It's mainly to look at the pictures. Um, but these are just some nice reefscape images of what some of the coral reefs look like along Florida, along Southeast Florida, apologies. All right, that was a little public service announcement video from um, Florida DEP. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Got to see some nice images of the reef. And moving on. All right, so a little overview of the different types of species that Florida's coral reef supports. How many kinds of fish do you think are associated with Florida's coral reefs? It's a pretty high number. There are 517 different species of fish along Southeast Florida. Total number of invertebrates. There's over 600 different types of invertebrates on Florida's coral reefs. So crabs, lobsters, um, you can see a lot of them here on the, on the images. There's over 70 different types of sponges alone. So just a massive amount of diversity in um, several different aspects. And there's over 43 different species of stony corals in South Florida, um, which there's a few main ones, but 43 is a pretty high number of species diversity um, throughout Southeast, Southeast Florida. Southeast Florida is also home to several threatened corals. Um, and just to give you an idea of the difference between endangered versus a threatened species, under the Endangered Species Act, a species is considered endangered if it's in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. So within the habitat that that specific organism lives in, is it in danger of an extinction? A species is considered threatened if it's likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future. So Florida has these um, seven threatened corals throughout. Um, so you're very lucky if you find these offshore, um, but it is important to notice, note that this adds extra protection to specific coral species in Southeast Florida. This is all important because one of the things I like to stress is how long it takes for these corals to grow. They are very slow growing animals. Um, certain species grow a little bit faster than others. We have these branching corals that grow approximately 10 centimeters per year. Per year. You have your staghorn coral and your elkhorn coral. So the staghorn uh, or acropora species is the photo on the left hand side with the very kind of thin branching fingers. And then the elkhorn coral is the top photo with much wider um, branches on that. But these are two of our faster growing corals. They are both threatened, um, but they are, you can find them if you're looking um, all along Southeast Florida. However, the really slow growing ones are the boulder corals. Let me back up and actually point out some of those on the endangered. So this mountainous star coral, the lobe star coral, boulder star coral, um, those are all bouldering corals, and it's a difference between how they grow. So these boulder corals 
and I want to show you this little video real quick. Um, but massive boulder corals, they grow only 0.3 to 2 centimeters per year. That's a very slow growth rate. Um, you can see this big coral in the video. It's one massive coral colony. And you can see all the little fish. Fish are probably about five inches, if that gives you scale. And you can kind of see a diver around in the background. But this coral would have taken hundreds of years to grow to this size. And this specific coral, I believe, uh, if I'm correct, I think this one's somewhere off of Hollywood. But it's a very large coral colony, and these are um, somewhat difficult to find these days, but they are very exciting when you see them. But it's it's a big impact to think about how long it takes for these to actually grow to be this size. And I guess to give you a reference, um, the branching corals growing 10 centimeters, it's about the size of a bagel, whereas 0.3 to 2 centimeters is more the size of a blueberry. So you have a big difference in growth rates in different species of corals. And just putting us back to uh, a little bit of where we started. So Florida's coral reef um, began forming about 10,000 years ago uh, after sea levels rose after the last ice age. So it took those 10,000 years for Florida's coral reef to, to develop into what it is today. The Great Barrier Reef is over 500,000 years old. So that's been growing for so much longer. Um, granted, it is rather bigger in scale. Um, but just to give you an idea of how long it takes for these coral reefs to really develop um, and, and continue to grow and prosper. It's a very slow growth rate. Um, and Florida's corals, uh, they have significant economic value. The entire Southeast Florida reef line from Martin County down through Monroe runs approximately 330 miles. It's, that's a very long um, reef tract just offshore a highly populated area. We have an average population or approximate population of 6.4 million, and that is always growing. Um, so these reefs are right offshore of a very densely populated and high tourist traffic destination area. Uh, reef sales and income can top 6.3 billion. I'm sure that industry is still growing. Uh, number of reef jobs is over 71,000, and South Florida hosts over 38 million visitors each year. Uh, all these numbers just continue to grow. So Florida's coral reef really does have a strong economic value and supports several different types of industries. On the downside, there are several threats to Florida's coral reef. Um, it's a, a multitude of different threats that all impact together. Um, and it's when you have repetitive small impacts, it's it all builds up. So while I don't want to say there's one aspect that impacts corals more than others, I like to think of it as everything coming together as a combination and impacting Florida's coral reef offshore. Um, all of these threats, yes, work together synergistically. It's it's an uphill battle um, with several threats, and and we work the best that we can to try and minimize impacts and balance the recreational use and the economic value of Florida's coral reef. So some examples you see in the photos, uh, invasive species, pollution, um, ghost, ghost fishing gear, marine debris, algae overgrowth, coastal construction and um, construction impacts, overfishing, direct impacts such as um, direct person people impacts or ship of, uh, ship groundings and direct impacts of that nature as well moving straight into direct impacts you can see this is a nice clear photo of a air show uh, an offshore air show with a lot of spectator vessels in the background um, and I'm not displaying this to say that all of those vessels are anchored on reef, 
but there's a good potential that at least several of them are. So when you think about impacts and cumulative impacts to coral reefs uh, in the direct manner, you think of things like vessel groundings and anchor impacts and things that are, are as it says, directly impacting them. So that's kind of where I'm going to take this focus uh, to direct impacts, um, primarily from either re recreational or commercial vessels. To give you a few examples of direct impacts, uh, these are just a couple photos. So you have a crushed coral on the top left, you have a sheared sponge in the top middle, um, the top right and the bottom middle photo both show photos from ship grounding events where it fractured, fractured the, um, the hard bottom substrate uh, on the reef. And on the bottom left, you have uh, an anchor impacting a sponge and bottom right, <laughs> apologies, you have a uh, yacht that actually just sunk straight down and you can see a little diver sitting on the back end of it um, for the photo. But all right, before we move into this section of an overview of Florida's Coral Reef Protection Act, does anyone have any questions about coral biology um, or Florida's coral reef in general? Hey, Molly, we had some really great questions coming through the chat. Um, the oh, first good. one is from Anne. She wants to know how quickly is the ocean warming affecting the slow growing corals? How quickly ocean warming is affecting? Um, Ooh. I haven't looked at it uh, recently, to be honest with you, so I don't want to give you the wrong information. I would say that um, ocean warming has somewhat of more of an impact on bleaching. Um, coral bleaching, I know, tends to occur more in seasons where you do have warmer climates. Uh, it's more common in the summer months. And um, I guess to delve a little more into <laughs> coral bio specifically, uh, corals themselves, it's an organism that has a, symbi a symbiotic relationship with this type of algae, it's called zooxanth zooxanthellae. Um, and the zooxanthellae algae lives within the coral tissue. And the coral feeds off of the photosynthesis of that algae and gets, I believe it's about 90% of its energy from that algae. Um, so when you have bleaching, those algae leave. So when the conditions aren't right, um, which usually is, is some sort of warming, not always, um, but it could be warming, that causes bleaching to happen. So those, those anthelae leave the coral tissue to go looking for somewhere else better to live. Uh, they don't like the conditions anymore, they leave. It is possible for new zooxanthellae to come and repopulate that coral tissue, um, but unfortunately if they don't, then that, that coral may likely die. And that's when you see the, the bright white skeleton underneath. Um, so I would say that's kind of the biggest worry with that, but yeah, overall, um, I think it's, it's a matter of monitoring and, and figuring out ways to, to reduce those types of climate change impacts. But unfortunately that's not my focus. So I don't want to give you too much more that, that might not be directly, uh, answering your question. Hopefully that helps. And says thank you. Yes. Um, another question in the chat is from Michael. He asked, given that visitation was down during um, the COVID pandemic, have we gotten um, or collected any evidence of improved conditions on water quality, fishing, or just reef conditions in general? Um, I haven't heard any any new reports or anything yet. Uh, I'm sure that is being studied right now, especially for use. Um, on the reefs and, and vessel use, um, tourism use, all of that has kind of changed in the past year. So I'm sure there will be some reports probably coming out soon with those impacts and, um, and trying to analyze whether it was a good thing or a bad thing or how that may have changed. Um, we have been monit monitoring water quality, but uh, again, I don't think believe those reports have come out yet. Awesome. And the last question is from Layla. She wants to know what ghost fishing is. Oh, ghost fishing. Um, it is essentially when fishing gear or I believe it could also just be any types of marine debris 
um, are no longer in use and are just floating loose in the ocean and they end up trapping um, fish, coral, uh, any sort of marine life gets trapped in that marine debris or no longer used fishing gear and is, un is unable to escape um, and is essentially caught with, with no end usage. All right, that's all the questions for now. Okay, good. All right, thank you, Jessica. And uh, yes, thank you for letting me know because I don't see those questions when I pull up the webinar. But all right, so moving forward with an overview of Florida's Coral Reef Protection Act. All right, so I don't want to bore you with too much um, statue law, but Florida's Coral Reef Protection Act is simply the law that makes it illegal to anchor on or otherwise damage coral reefs in state waters in Florida. The goal of this act was to reduce coral reef impacts through increased legal authority. Um, this specifically targets unplanned direct impacts, so things that are have not been permitted, have not been mitigated for, and are directly impacting coral reefs and coral reef resources. It was passed by Florida legislature um, back in July 2009, and it was recently updated this past July in 2020. Um, this law gives Florida DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, the authority to enforce violations against the, or so damages against the reef, and collect damages from responsible parties. Currently, DEP is the only agency enforcing the Coral Reef Protection Act. Um, but we do work a lot with local and federal partners to help us in enforcement of this. It provides protection to coral reef resources in the um, five county region. So it covers Martin County, Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, and Monroe County. Um, but this does not apply to any of the hard bottom habitat over on the West Coast. Um, it is only meant for the Southeast Florida reef tract area. Under this act, um, Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, can pursue the owner, operator, insurer, or manager of the vessel as the responsible party. Um, it is a civil process, so having the ability to pursue um, multiple people as the responsible party really does increase our resolution of these cases. Um, and resolution of, of these violations uh, that cause damage to coral reef. There are a few de designations in the law to mention. Um, the responsible party, if damage is caused, and this, this primarily deals with vessel groundings because for things like anchoring um, or other types of impact, such as maybe a cable drag, the responsible party at the time might not realize that they're causing damage. But if it is something that's a lot more noticeable, uh, it's required that the responsible party notified the EP within 24 hours of damage and remove the vessel within 72 hours. Um, this gives us the ability to, to work with them and help minimize any additional impacts uh, and make sure if a, if a vessel is grounded, for example, we can work with the salvage company to make sure that they're removing it in a way that doesn't cause additional impacts. The responsible party must work with us um, in a timely manner to restore coral reef to its pre-impact condition. There is the av uh, availability to collect penalties and compensatory mitigation, as well as recovery of resource trustee response costs. And resource trustees are local county partners, um, different agency partners in Southeast Florida that are trained and work with us directly to assess these types of coral reef incidents. Um, so we, we try and pay them back for their time. And there is one caveat in the Coral Reef Protection Act. Um, it was written in that if there is a first time offense and it's a recreational impact and the damage is about less than one square meter, we, we will send an educational or a warning letter in lieu of pursuing um, penalties and compensatory mitigation. So, for first time recreational violations, there's the understanding that maybe they didn't know um, or it wasn't intentional. Well, hopefully it's never intentional, but um, 
we try and, and educate as much as we can to try and minimize and prevent these impacts from happening in the first place. Um, there are several, several different mechanisms that DEP can use to recover costs um, and recover for damages for the coral reef. There is a defined civil penalty schedule in the Coral Reef Protection Act. Um, it does increase by the area of coral reef damaged, uh, and it does get rather significant. Um, if, for example, if the damage is greater than 10 square meters, the civil penalty would equate to $1,500 per square meter of damage. Um, so if you have something that is smaller, like uh, a recreational anchor that caused, I don't know, three or four square meters of impact, it's going to be a significantly lower penalty than if um, a massive ship anchor from a commercial vessel caused um, 100 square meters of damage. So there's a different rate that that is calculated at. We also have the ability to recover compensatory mitigation. Um, I always kind of like the analysis of if if you were driving your car in the redwood forest, and this isn't a very likely scenario, but if you were driving your car in a redwood forest and you get into a car accident and you knock down that 100-year redwood tree, you're going to get a ticket for reckless driving, but you're also going to have to replace that tree. Um, and planting a sapling does not equate to a 100-year-old redwood tree. So that's kind of where compensatory mitigation comes into play. It accounts for the ecological services lost um, due to this incident. So due to coral reef damage, what is the ecosystem losing from that damage and how can we make up for that? We are also able to recover trustee costs. As I mentioned before, those are our trained resource trustee partners that assist us with assessments, uh, restoration if necessary, and general case enforcement. There are also potential additional costs um, and potential other uh, avenues that we need to work on some of these incidents, such as triage and stabilization. So initial um, consolidation at the site, uh, if there are loose corals that can be salvaged, if there's anything that can be done immediately that can minimize the overall total loss or overall total damage at the site that would be taken uh, right away. Primary restoration, we have the option to require physical and biological restoration. Um, this is more for bigger incidents where there really needs to be, um, somebody really needs to go in and, and restore this area so that it can start to recover. Um, this could be piling rubble together and, and cementing it and stabilizing things back together. It could be transplanting, new, or transplanting corals to the area to help repopulate or salvaging corals that are there existing and reattaching them. There's several different options that we could take and it really just depends on the type of damage and impact at the site that will gauge how we move forward with any sort of restoration. Um, the Coral Reef Protection Act also does account for long-term monitoring. It includes that uh, we do need to monitor for up to 10 years or at least 10 years to make sure that the incident site is recovering naturally on its own. Um, and one more, I guess one more thing to mention um, in terms of civil penalties and compensatory mitigation to give you an idea of the overall value um, of coral reefs and related to these cases. Civil penalties, as I mentioned, can, can grow rather large, but there is a cap um, per occurrence under the Coral Reef Protection Act there is a cap for civil penalties of $375,000. Um, so per incident, it, civil penalties cannot exceed that. However, compensatory mitigation does not have a dollar cap. Um, and compensatory mitigation can be rather large depending on the type of incident. Uh, and that is all factored in. We use what's called a habitat equivalency analysis model to determine compensatory mitigation. Um, And all of this, all of the money that is collected, uh, well, not collected, recovered um, for these incidents, it all gets put into a specific trust fund um, with designated uses that go right back into the resource. 
So it's not going into a black hole. It's not being used for unrelated things. Any money recovered for these cases goes directly back into the resource um, through this trust fund mechanism that we have set up. So specific things like incident response for coral reef, um, emergency stabilization, restoration if needed. Uh, if, if we need to go in and restore a site, if there is no responsible party, that's what this money is available for. It also helps fund my program. It's right now me and, and one other person, Jessica, um, covering our northern area. Um, but this this money can go anywhere that it's it's needed within, within reason uh, for a nearby reef. Wanted to give you an example of when we, a uh, time recently that we did use some of these funds to restore coral reefs. Um, the Coral Reef Conservation Program, my program, restored two commercial ship grounding sites. Um, both happened in 2006. As you can see on this map, it's uh, a pretty old map, but it points out a lot of locations of previous incidents, um, mainly ship groundings and anchorings of larger commercial vessels. So the two stars are the two ship groundings that we went in and restored. Uh, at the time when these occurred, it happened in 2006, the Coral Reef Protection Act was not in place until 2009, so that was not there yet. Um, so minimal restoration was done initially at the time of the two ship groundings. However, we performed a study in 2010 and showed that neither of the sites were naturally recovering as we hoped. Um, essentially, there was too much rubble at the sites, and it was rolling around and preventing future natural growth uh, at the two sites. So direct management action was deemed necessary to fully restore these sites. We began, construct we began planning in 2012 and completed construction in December of 2015. Uh, we just had our five-year monitoring event last year and are going to work up a report and show how, how it worked out, how um, well our efforts are leading to promote natural recovery at the site. Let's give you an idea of what these look like. Um, on first glance, they may not look too different. Uh, the top two photos are the same area and the bottom two photos are the same area. So essentially what we needed to do here was um, each of these two incident sites had a bow scar location. So where the vessel grounded itself, um, it had almost a divot, a rather large divot in the hard bottom substrate of the reef. Uh, and that caused a lot of rubble. All of the limestone there was kind of broken apart. You can see on the um, left side photos on the top, especially that it's kind of flattened on one area and a bunch of rubble is pushed up on the other. So what we did at both of these sites was collect all the loose rubble that we could pile them into the bow scar and make a nice level area, and then place large limestone boulders on top in a single layer to essentially cap down that loose rubble. We then went in with a thin layer of cement grout to make sure everything really was contained and stabilized down underneath the limestone big boulders and the grout as well. Um, so the main difference between the before and after photos is the before photos, everything is loose, nothing is stabilized, and it's all just, all that rubble is rolling around. On the right-hand side photos, you can see the larger limestone boulders that were placed. And though it looks like there's still all of this loose rubble, all of the, those smaller pieces of rubble are actually, they were hand placed into the cement to make it look a lot more natural. So while you might not tell too much difference between the photos, the right-hand side after photos, everything is fully stabilized. Um, at those sites. We have not done biological restoration yet. Um, only physical restoration was performed at the time for these, these two sites. Uh, reason being that this happened in 2015 and right before in 2014 was when we started seeing a lot of the stony coral tissue loss disease starting to spread in Southeast Florida. Um, which I'm not really getting too much into tonight, it's kind of a side note, but that's the reason we did not do biological restoration at this site. So maybe in the future that could be an option. 
um, but there are still some corals here and it's it's turning into a pretty nice example site of seeing actual natural recruitment and um, long-term success at the site. So hopefully our, our report will show that soon. Um, so if you have any more questions on that, feel free to follow up with me later. But um, yeah, we are excited about this project. So, all right, before I get specifically into what my program um, does with the Coral Reef Protection Act. Does anyone have any questions on the law itself? Uh, Molly, there's a question in the chat um, that, let me read this here. Uh, what is the difference between physical and biological restoration? Ah, um, so biological restoration, there's some sort of organism component, um, uh, reattaching corals or um, outplanting corals to an area um, so that you're kind of building up that biological aspect at the site. You're, you're putting more organisms out there already um, or doing some something on the more organism side with corals or um, octocorals, sea fans, sponges, anything along that line. Physical is just that the physical hard bottom structure um, in the sense of collecting the rubble and cementing it down underneath those limestone boulders. So the, the kind of physical construction side versus the organism restoration. Excellent. Um, and so this is not necessarily our area as much, but Anne was wondering, um, you know, with all your time assisting with captaining on the boat, did you guys see any, um, um, oh no, what's the question? Did you see any negative impacts on the corals in Biscayne Bay when they were having all of the, the fish die offs in 2020? Um, I have not recently. Um, I haven't been in the bay in a while, to be honest with you. I've driven the boat for our Biscayne Bay Aquatic Preserve staff. Uh, but I have not been physically in the water to look at the corals and kind of compare. So unfortunately, that'd be more of a question for them. Um, but we could we can definitely send you their contact if you'd like for for afterwards as follow up. That would be um, Laura Eldridge and her team with Biscayne Bay Aquatic Preserves. Okay. We'll make sure that um, we put that information in the chat for everyone. Um, and then one last quick question. Are there any um, additional plans for public service announcements to inform people about the restoration loss? Ooh, um, oh, do you, so do you mean, um, uh, about Just restoration loss specifically? Um, not that I know of, um, since this one, this Core Reef Protection Act came out in 2009, um, there, I believe this is before I started here, but there was a um, PSA campaign around that time and press releases. Um, and I know I've done a, a PSA in the past two years that targeted more marine events and offshore spectator vessels um, to promote using mooring buoys or anchoring in sand. Um, otherwise, I know that our office is putting out PSAs targeting, or I guess, a more general messaging for Florida's coral reef, but nothing about restoration laws specifically that I know of. Okay, and that's all the questions there are right now. All right, thank you. Okay, so moving into an overview of the Reef Injury Prevention and Response Program, or RIPPER program. Uh, we're a big fan of acronyms in my office. So the Reef Injury Prevention and Response Program, you'll see the same map that I showed earlier with the, uh, a bunch of older vessel groundings and anchorings. So FWRI, or Florida's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, used to be the lead for vessel grounding response on coral reefs. Um, however, there was a series of incidents between 1994 and 2009, um, as you can see on that map. Uh, where it became necessary that uh, we needed to hire someone full-time. So when 
the um, Florida DEP took over responsibility for these vessel groundings in 2006. Um, they were working on them as an office, but as those incidents continued um, past 2006 and up until 2009, it was necessary to hire a full-time position. Um, so that was my position. And this overall led to the creation of this program, the Reef Injury Prevention and Response Program. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of incidents kept happening. Um, this map specifically is offshore of Fort Lauderdale. Um, there used to be a different configuration for the designated commercial ship anchorage. Um, the US Coast Guard uh, regulates the designated commercial anchorages. Um, and you can kind of tell the dotted yellow lines, those two older boundaries was the previous configuration of the Port Everglades commercial anchorage. Um, but as you can tell, a lot of these vessels seem to have missed that anchorage and unfortunately ended up on the reef line. Um, in 2008, the anchorage was reconfigured to be this kind of sideways T box uh, in light blue. And knock on wood, it has significantly cut back on the number of incidents that we've had. Um, while we still have anchor incidents of uh, vessels anchoring on reef, we have not had as many vessel groundings. Um, and I think that's that's a pretty good success. So um, yeah, it's kind of a, a little history into how my program was, was created. Um, our program goal is to reduce the impacts to coral reef habitat through education, outreach, increased enforcement, and targeted projects. And our program objective is to lead the coordination and response for groundings, anchorings, sunken vessel incidents impacting Florida's coral reef. Um, so offshore Miami, Broward, Palm Beach, and Martin counties. Um, yeah, we've we've seen a multitude of different types of incidents, uh, ground, anchorings being the, the most common, but also groundings, um, sunken vessels, a cable drag, uh, plane crash. We've seen a lot of different types of incidents, and they're all very different. So we learn something new every time we, we go out and find something. Um, we also focus on reducing direct impacts through education and outreach, such as prevention of injuries. We work a lot with the US Coast Guard through auxiliary, um, other agencies working to increase our presence on the, on the nautical charts. Um, only in the past few years, we've added language in the uh, US Coast Pilot. Um, we support local county mooring buoy programs. So we try and have a hand in a few different things that work with that same goal of preventing and minimizing coral reef impacts, um, direct impacts specifically. So again, this is Southeast Florida um, and we are focusing on this Northern area. So my office, um, Florida DEP's Coral Reef Conservation Program has jurisdiction in this Northern area. Um, this section of the reef runs 105 miles, uh, depth varies from about 15 feet to 95 feet where the reefs are, and Florida DEP has jurisdiction of state waters from the mean high water line all the way out to three nautical miles. Um, so now I have several um, photos to show you. So it's a lot of photos, um, but I wanted to give you an idea of the different types of injury that you might see associated with these types of direct impacts. Um, so we have everything def uh, well defined to help us with our assessments, but to give you an idea of some of the things that we see when we go out, um, displaced sand and rubble. You can see a scraped uh, organism, scraped substrate as well. This is just a scraped coral right across the top. Shearing, we see sheared sponges all the time. Um, this is a very common injury type that we see, especially from anchor lines. Uh, and you can see the bright white tissue showing that it was pretty recent. Dislodged, so when a, a coral or any other organism just becomes completely detached from the bottom. Transferred bottom paint, we've seen this uh, several times where the anti-fouling paint on the bottom of, of a ship's hull gets transferred onto an organism or onto the, the hard bottom itself. Substrate scarring, 
Um, I know this is a little different, difficult to see, but there is a kind of well-defined gouge right through um, in that kind of trough through the center of the photo. So that would be scarring of the substrate. Fractured stony coral, when it's crushed or broken into multiple pieces. Fractured hard substrate. Um, so this you'd see this mainly with the ship grounding, but it can happen when an anchor hits, um, depending on if it just hits in the wrong way or uh, if it's a really big, heavy anchor, it could cause fracturing. And also burial. Um, we see this mainly if um, maybe a vessel runs aground and they try and power themselves off. The, the impact created by their, their engine could uh, bury a lot of different organisms in sediment. So just some additional photos for you of what we might see at a typical anchoring. So um, again, I mentioned the white, the bright white tissue of sponges. Um, that helps us notice that it's a very recent injury. Uh, you can see a few different sponge fragments all in the middle. Those are the um, Zesto mutata, the big barrel sponges. You can also, and I know this is a little difficult to see too, but straight through along the middle of this photo, you can see that the bottom is a lot lighter and it's been scraped off by an anchor. And again, you can see a bit of light scraping. We see this pretty often with anchoring. So um, just wanted to show you a map of what this might look like. Um, typically, we could see an anchor right in the middle of the reef line. But this one specifically I like to show as an example because this vessel intended to anchor in sand and their anchor likely did fall in sand. But because they were so close to the reef, their anchor chain swung all along that um, eastern edge of the reef line uh, and caused damage that way. So that's that's one of our most common incidents that we end up seeing. And I also wanted to show you an example of a grounding. So this is a ship that ran aground down in the Florida Keys. Uh, you can see the vessel hull in a few of these photos just sitting right on top of the reef. Um, all of that lighter colored limestone uh, is new fresh rubble that has just been fractured and overturned. Uh, here's the vessel as it sunk. It was only in about eight feet of water. Here it is underwater. You can see the toilet right in the middle. Uh, unfortunately, this vessel broke down with storm impacts um, and it was a lot more cleanup than we had hoped, but I just wanted to show you the amount of impact that it could make. Um, and it doesn't always clear cut everything. Sometimes you have damage and there are still areas that are okay. Um, but even this big boulder in the background, it, while it looks like there's still corals uh, living on it, you can see um, it almost looks like it was flipped over. So we see a lot of this type of injury, a lot of small rubber, rubble creation, um, fractured corals, crushed corals. Um, this is kind of what we we usually see with a grounded vessel. Uh, and this incident was actually in the Keys, if, if that looks familiar to you. While my office does not have jurisdiction to, um, well, while the Florida National Marine Sanctuary typically handles everything in the Keys, we do often assist if there is an, a coral reef protection incident in state waters, we do still have the ability to run our enforcement process um, and recover damages that way. And to give you an idea for scale, this is two of our divers uh, measuring out the primary area of impact from that ship grounding. All right, and I wanted to I wanted to show you as well um, an idea of the number of incidents that we actually receive. Um, so this is a uh, total of injuries or of incident reports that we've received in the four county region, so the northern portion of the reef track, not including the Keys, um, from when the Coral Reef Protection Act started on July 1st, 2009, until the very end of 2019. Uh, and again, the main one. Here is the total number of anchor incidents. 
So it's a lot. We have a lot of different types of incidents. Um, definitely varies by county. But you can see uh, there are a lot of incidents reported throughout the years, which unfortunately means a lot of direct impact. All right, how we receive these reports. Um, so we receive reports a couple different ways. Um, U.S. Coast Guard works with us directly. If they hear of something that may have caused impact to coral reef, they will pass it along to us. We work with them to help figure out vessel owner information for the responsible party. Um, we also follow the automated automatic identification system or AIS trackers. Um, the majority of commercial vessels have this already um, and recreational vessels over a certain size, I believe it's either 60 or 80 feet, typically will have an AIS tracker. Um, it's kind of like a, almost a radio transmission um, that pings their location back to satellites, which we can then follow on Port Vision 360, which is a paid service that we use, or marine traffic, if any of you are interested, that is a free online service where you can look up any vessel in the world that has an AIS tracker, uh, see photos of them, see where they've been. A lot of this information is freely available online. Um, we do receive a lot of our information that way. And stakeholder citizen reporting, so that's where uh, the local community comes in. We get a lot of reports from local diving community and also from the Southeast Florida Action Network, which I will get into in a little bit. So I just, I always find that uh, people are curious to see what we're looking at. So the right hand side is what you'll see if you pull up marine traffic. The left hand side is what we see in Port Vision 360. So we create designated alert zones on the map um, all along the reef in this northern, count, northern reef tract. And we set an alert. So any vessel with an AIS system that travels below one knot, um, we receive an email and we pull their vessel track. We see if they potentially anchored, if they potentially anchored on coral reef. And then that triggers us to go and perform a site check to see if there is actual impact at that site. Um, so that's how we get a good majority of our, of our reports. Um, we use the one knot as our threshold to weed out anyone that's just transiting through. Um, we've seen that if, if you're transiting below one knot, you might be about to anchor or you're already anchored, so that helps us narrow it down a bit. Um, but that's how we run our, our reports. That's how we um, find vessels that have potentially caused impact. Um, and then to give you another example of what it looks like when we do map these, this is a pretty well-defined vessel swing. So you see this well-defined arc. Um, so I like to think of it where is if you continue that into a whole circle, right about in the middle is probably where the anchor was. Um, so that's what we estimate. That's where we use to um, visit in person and do a site check at the uh, site. We scuba dive it and look for um, recent impacts that are potentially attributed to the vessel um, that we were alerted about. And we also, so this, pink versus the uh, light sand color. It's, it is what it is. It's uh, sand versus coral reef and hard bottom. We use these benthic habitat maps. And we also use the symmetry layers uh, that give us a more detailed view. So we overlay this as well um, and are able to get a better idea for planning future site follow-ups and performing assessments to uh, assess the total amount of injury at a potential site. Um, so for this example, they had a, we did a site check, we did an assessment, and the damage that we found was contained in this area circled in red. And based on the swing of the vessel and all of their position points that we found, it's reasonable to assume that they were the ones that caused this damage due to their anchor chain. And now uh, this is where we have citizen reporting come in. So our citizen reporting um, network and hotline is called the Southeast Florida Action Network or CFAN. It's a community-based reporting and response program for marine incidents that affect the Southeast Florida coral reef ecosystem. It's obviously impossible for us to know what's happening across the whole region. So we rely on members of the community to let us know, observe anything unusual, 
which is how this program came, came about. CFAN allows people to report those incidents and then we help coordinate the response. So using the CFAN reports, our program can tackle three main goals, uh, enhancing marine debris cleanup efforts, increasing the response to vessel groundings and coral damage, and providing an early detection of potentially harmful biological disturbances. So this is our um, way for the public to let us know if anything seems a little off in the habitat, if they notice something very obvious that's damaged, or if they notice fish kills, all of that can be reported here. Just like my program, um, Reef Injury Prevention and Response, the CFAN um, area covers the entire northern reef tract, Martin County, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade. So different incidents have different responders. We take incident reports from our observer network and we're pass, we pass those details on to the property authority. Um, we then make sure to follow up and contact the citizen reporter to let them know their report was received and processed. Um, for example, a couple weeks ago, we had a report of a large coral colony in Broward County um, that had stony coral tissue loss disease. That report was passed along to our partners at Nova Southeastern University, and they were able to send out their disease response team uh, to locate and treat the lesion on that coral colony. So. We take your report and we pass it to the appropriate stakeholder. If it's not us, um, we make sure the right person gets it and ideally responds as quickly and, and effectively as we can. So there's three, there's a couple of different um, programs that focus on specific incident types. So we have marine debris reporting, uh, removal as well. And that focuses on, yes, marine debris reporting and removal. It's a little straightforward. Um, the Reef Injury Prevention and Response Program, my program, covers vessel grounding and anchor damage. And then coral disease and bleaching, when that's reported, it uh, is passed to our Bleach Watch Program. All right. So, um, CFAN is available as a website and a phone number as well. Um, on the website, you can learn more about CFAN, how to become a Bleach Watch observer if you want. Um, but most importantly, you'll find the hot, hotline number you can call directly or find the online report form. Um, either of these are, work very well. The preferred method is online because there's several different prompts where we can make sure we get all of the necessary information to provide the most appropriate response. Uh, this is what the website looks like now, just to give you an idea for the report form. It has been updated recently. Um, so what type of incident did you observe is the start. Uh, give us a little bit of information about the site. What did you see there, the date and time? Um, knowing which county you were in really helps us categorize where the reports are coming from more easily. And the latitude and longitude GPS coordinates, those are, the more accurate that you can get, the more helpful it will be for us. Um, there is a rather large degree of variation uh, if the, between if you only have a couple numbers versus if you have um, a full, a full set of GPS coordinates. Uh, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. If somebody says, oh, go 200 feet from, from or it's 200 feet offshore from the, the water tower. It's very difficult to find something in the water. Um, but if we have accurate GPS coordinates, it makes everything a lot more easier. Uh, and then this next section is all about the actual incident. Um, it'll, it'll, the formatting will vary depending on the in incident that you are reporting about. Um, but you can say what you witnessed, if, if there was a, a vessel involved, if you could tell a vessel registration number or any identifying marks. Um, and there will always be a box for additional information. So if you're unsure where something will fit, you can always type in extra um, and we'll make sure we'll be able to, to see all of your comments. And then finally, we'll ask uh, some questions about yourself just to make sure that we are able to contact you and follow up as necessary. Sometimes we have additional questions. 
Um, but we also want to let you know what action was taken as a result of your report. Um, here's some helpful links uh, if you'd like to take a screenshot or I'll have them come up a little bit later. But these are our floridascoralreef.org primary website. The cfan.net is our cfan website. Um, so hopefully that's pretty easy to remember. There's also additional information about coral reefs on the Florida Keys website, um, specifically about coral disease, if you're interested in learning more about stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, and we also have a citizen support organization called Friends of Our Florida Reefs that helps support DEP's coral reef conservation program. Additionally, I just wanted to provide some mapping resources. Um, we do have our map within Esri's Field Maps platform. Um, so the free mobile app is called Field Maps by Esri ArcGIS. And if you, um, if you upload or if you download that and you search for our map, which is called the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Locator. Um, yes, yeah, Southeast Florida Coral Reef Locator. It will pull up a map that works almost like Google Maps where it'll show you your pinpoint location and it'll tell you if you're over reef or if you're over sand, if there's a mooring buoy nearby. Uh, it's a really helpful app so that you can make sure you, you find a mooring buoy or you throw your anchor in the sand and avoid any direct coral impacts. Um, on our website, we also have uh, the NOAA charts and benthic maps overlaid. Um, so you can find the NOAA nautical charts or you can see the coral layers just like in our app, but overlaid on the nautical charts. So just different resources um, for boating, diving, fishing to, to help you out offshore and make sure you anchor in a way that um, minimizes coral damage. There are uh, over 200 free public mooring buoys in Southeast Florida uh, in the Northern Four County region. Um, numbers vary by county a little bit, but we do have all of this information available on our website as well. Um, and these buoys uh, are very useful. They're typically near a reef site anyways. Um, and I believe the majority of them are intended for vessels 35 feet and under. Um, but it's a great way to avoid anchoring or risking damage to coral reef uh, if you can use one of these public mooring buoys. We do like to show this little video. Again, there's no sound on this one, but I can narrate you pretty well. Um, so using a mooring buoy properly uh, is, is a pretty important and it just makes sure you're not damaging the buoy and you're not damaging your boat. So when you're approaching a buoy, you want to approach from downwind, have your boat hook ready, and you grab the pickup line of the mooring buoy. Then you place your bow line through the hole and cleat off back to your boat. So if you notice, he's not attaching the mooring buoy line directly to his boat. Um, that could um, damage the mooring buoy, and it's just a lot safer if you use your bow line to loop through. Um, when you leave the buoy later, all you have to do is just untie your cleat and just let it slip through, and you'll drift down current. And no, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, so using uh, a mooring buoy is is much preferred to anchoring. Um, it's, it's easier for the boater uh, and it's less impactful on, on potential reef. If you do want to anchor, um, please try and, and anchor in sand. Uh, you can use, again, our Southeast Florida Coral Reef Locator map uh, or the NOAA nautical charts to help you find a place in sand. If the bottom is visible, you can look for sand that way um, and make sure you put out enough scope based on the depth that you're anchoring at. Um, if, there's, if there's poor weather, if you have strong seas, you always wanna let out a little bit more scope in your anchor just to be safe. When you're picking up the anchor, try and move your boat a little bit forward so that the anchor is directly underneath you and try and just pull it straight up. Um, when over the anchor chain, place the boat into neutral, lift it straight up. Do not attempt to pull it um, directly over or like kind of don't back down your boat so that you kind of drag it out. Um, it could cause your anchor to drag and cause damage as now you've seen with all the photos.
And here's some additional resources. So I'm just about at the end. If you want to take a screenshot of this for any of the extra websites, um, we did just get a new shortened URL link to make things a little easier to get to my program website. So the Reef Injury Prevention and Response website is also now floridadep.gov backslash ripper, R-I-P-R. Um, so a little easier to get to our website now, but there's a lot of different references there. We have brochures. We have a brochure about the mooring buoy locations, uh, an instruction card for how to use the, the Esri Field Maps app, um, the NOAA nautical charts, and then there's a few other websites here that I mentioned before for CFAN. Uh, the Sanctuary Keys, and our citizen support organization, FloridaReef.org. Um, all right, so I know we're a couple minutes over, but this is my last slide. Um, so just make sure you, you go out, you still have fun, but try and protect the reefs at the same time. Use the resources available, um, be aware of your surroundings, and if an accident happens or if you witness it, please just make sure you report it so that we can uh, work to resolve it as best we can. All right, I know that was a lot to get through, um, but, and I assume there's probably some questions, uh, but thank you for your time tonight and, and listening to me. Um, and yeah, feel free to email me with any follow-up questions or if if you want to be directed to um, any specific program, I can also help you follow up there. Um, but all right, I'm sure there are some questions. Yeah, great presentation, Molly. Um, looks like the only question that you haven't answered yet is from Michael. And he's wondering, are there any uh, consideration in the new Southeast Florida coral restoration area to create increased buffers related to how coast ships can approach the coast? So I, th I think I heard you're you asking um, for, I guess, a buffer along the coastline to, can you repeat yeah, that, how sorry? Close ships, how close um, ships can get to the coastline. Ah, okay. Um, so, kind of, I, it's kind of a difficult, well, it's not a difficult question, but there's kind of a long answer to it. Um, so in the Florida Keys, um, there is a, you saw that big boundary on one of my previous maps marking the sanctuary. The Florida Keys also has designations called uh, particularly sensitive seas area and an area to be avoided. Um, and those have restrictions on how close larger commercial ships can get to the coral reefs um, without additional authorization. Um, the reefs in the Keys, however, extend a lot further from the, the land. Um, and it is a lot shallower. So the majority of those bigger vessels stay away regardless because it's too shallow, it's harder to navigate, it's a lot safer for them to stay away. In the Northern portion, um, so Miami up to Martin County, there is not that boundary. Uh, there is no particularly sensitive seas area or area to be avoided as a designation. Um, we recently had a boundary around this northern area. It's called, they just updated the name. It's called the Kristen Jacobs Coral Reef Ecosystem Conservation Area. Um, and right now it doesn't have, there's no restrictions or anything in there about keeping vessels away. It's more just um, a boundary to denote that there are coral reefs here. Um, so it's more of an informational boundary. Um, but the northern reef area also, um, the reefs do not run as, they don't extend as far offshore as they do in the Keys. Uh, they're a lot deeper in certain areas too. So a lot of the main shipping routes do run right along um, that, well, I didn't get too much into this, but there's kind of three reef tracks that run parallel. There's um, the inner reef, the middle reef, and the outer reef. And that outer reef is in the kind of 90 foot range of depth. Um, and that's, a, a decent area for a lot of the commercial ships to transit. Um, they like to stay closer to the coast because it's not putting them into the Gulf Stream. Uh, sometimes that, that can use up a lot of fuel as I understand it. So it just, the way the geography works out, 
the there is a much um, higher concentration of commercial shipping and passage that runs right along the reefs. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon um, because it, it would just have a lot of impacts um, to a lot of different industries. But yeah, so that, that's kind of why we do the prevention and the outreach and the education to try and educate uh, a lot of the shipping companies and commercial vessels to be wary of where they anchor um, and how they're transiting over these protected reefs um, to prevent any damage. So we work with them as best we can. Um, unfortunately, there there is a lot of traffic that, that runs right over the reef, but um, yeah, we, we just try and balance it as best we can, do our outreach and prevention and try and minimize the damage as much as possible. Um, I know that was kind of a long answer, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's kind of just geography based of where the ships end up is, is kind of what I always thought of it. Yeah, great question, Michael. And you know, part part of what we do here at Ripper is we monitor that. So if they're over the reef, um, we can call the Coast Guard and ask them to go back into the anchorage, you know, to try to prevent damage. Yeah, when we when we receive those vessel alerts, if we're able to catch it in time, we call the Coast Guard and we ask them to have that vessel move. And ideally, we try and if there's damage already occurring, we try and catch it and and prevent it from um, from ha instead of happening for a week, maybe it just happens for a day and we prevent the the majority of it. Um, so we do work with them a lot. Uh, we work, yeah, as I mentioned before, with Coast Guard. We work with the ports. Um, a lot of those industries to kind of make sure that everybody is educated about that um, and try and prevent it as much as we can. Yep. Um, another question in the chat is approximately how long can coral survive once damaged until the incidents can be reported and uh, the recovery process can begin? Um, we have, so I went through those different photos of different injury types and those, depending on the type of injury, they are assigned different recovery rates um, based on our best understanding and the literature, opinions of our research trustees. We have developed recovery times for different um, types of injury. So it all kind of varies. Um, so it's hard to say if we have, um, yeah, something like an anchor incident is going to have very different types of damage and injury to organisms and to hard bottom than a full ship grounding. So we have to account for that. Um, yeah, hopefully some of these, and it's hard too, because it's um, there's not too much literature investigating a, a hundred or a 200 year ship grounding on coral reef. Um, so we're still working on that. <laughs> um, but as we as we develop reports, as we work on the monitoring, especially for things like our restoration and trying to gauge natural recovery, um, we do build as much knowledge as we can to better inform our decisions for recovery times and how we move forward with things like that. But unfortunately, I can't really say definitively how long it'll take something to recover versus something else. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we do have to try to account for that uh, when we run Coral Reef Protection Act cases. Okay, that looks like all the questions in the chat. All right, well, thank you everyone. Um, again, my contact information is up on the screen. If, feel free to email me with any additional questions you have. Um, and if I can't answer them myself, I will get you the answer from somebody who knows. Um, but yeah, thank you again for listening and uh, I hope it was informative and you learned something tonight. Um, but thank you for your attendance and yeah, have a good evening.